Hello and welcome to this series on the sermons of Wesley. If you didn't know, he had 44 canonical or official sermons that although they do form uh, pretty much the basis of Methodist doctrine, they were primarily meant to give us a guide toward spiritual growth and maturity in Christ. Uh, this is not a regular session. These normally will be recorded Zoom sessions for our midweek Bible fellowship which you are free to join. If you just send an email to the church, we will send you the link. Uh, the text for these sermons is available online at predicuasi.wordpress.com slash preaching Wesley uh, from a book by Gary Hall uh, called Preaching Wesley, John Wesley's 44 Sermons in Modern English. <clears throat> the versions we're gonna be looking at are much more abbreviated and with less these and thous, they don't sound so much like the King James English. Uh, today we're going to be looking at the first three sermons, first being salvation by faith. So in these first three sermons, Wesley's going to talk about faith, faith, faith. He's actually going to kind of do the same thing in the second three sermons. He wants to make sure that we get this right, that we understand it in uh, proper terms, and we don't think of faith as just a set of beliefs or a set of practices, uh, something that you would get at any social club or cultural or political commitment, he wants to make sure we understand that this is much deeper, that we get it right, so that we don't put a wrong foot forward at the beginning of our journey. He says this at the beginning, this is the governing scripture for this sermon, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. This is a foundational premise that he's going to come to again and again and again, that even faith itself is not a gift. God makes it possible. But let's get into uh, what he means by these terms. Grace is God's gift of unmerited favor. And he observes in this that uh, only rotten fruit grows on diseased trees, making a simple point that apart from God, we're not really able to do anything that is godly, nothing that would be acceptable to God. We have nothing, therefore, to boast about before God or people. Now, he says that God's grace is, of course, the source of salvation. It's a free gift from God, not based on anything that we've done, but based on who God is, the all-loving, all-powerful God of our salvation. But faith is the condition for receiving it. And in this study, we seek to understand what faith is. It is certain that it cannot be religious faith. This is probably the kind of faith that most people think of when they think about faith. Um, and he refers this to the kind of faith that so-called to him, false religions have. They don't have the faith that saves. Salvation requires true faith in God as revealed in the scriptures. In other words, it's not what you think it is, it's what the scriptures say faith is. Faith must be more than living moral lives based on religious principles. That means that it cannot simply or merely be the faith of, I'm going to commit myself to a certain set of practices, a certain way of life, a certain set of beliefs. It's not that. And on that note, he says it cannot be the faith devils have. James 2.19 says, Thou believest that there is one God, you do well. The devils also believe and tremble. In fact, in uh, one sermon, Wesley says this about people who can be very orthodox, they can believe all the right things, have no errors or relatively no errors in doctrine, and yet be a stranger to the kind of faith that he's talking about. He, the hypothetical um, uh, person who doesn't get it, may be almost as orthodox as the devil, though indeed not altogether, for everyone errs in something, whereas we can't well conceive him to hold any erroneous opinion, and may all the while be as great a stranger as he, the devil, to the religion of the heart. Wesley will use that term relatively frequently, talking about the religion of the heart, not just something that's in the head or in the our personal commitments or habits. So orthodoxy isn't going to do it. And then he makes an interesting point. He says it can't be pre-Calvary faith, the faith that the disciples had 
before Jesus was crucified. He observes it was not until the Savior was sacrificed on the cross that they could receive saving grace by faith. This is an a interesting statement. And although Wesley doesn't anywhere make this point, it's recognized now that the story of Jesus follows in many particulars the coronation expectations that ancient people would have had for their king. There would have been a singling out and an anointing. He's designated as the person who's going to be king. This happened at his baptism. Heaven's part, the spirit rests on him. The voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son. With him, I'm well pleased. And then immediately after this designation, the king designate was supposed to do some great act, usually a military act, to establish his authority through action. And what happened immediately after the baptism? Temptation. He went to be tempted by the devil, pretty much the worst enemy there is, the biggest enemy of all. And then finally, there is a coronation. And in John especially, and in Mark, we can see that Jesus's coronation was his crucifixion, his crown of thorns, and his going to the cross. It was his death that broke the power of sin over us and also made him king. So whatever you make of that, what you will, it can't be a pre-Calvary faith. It has to include that understanding of Jesus's kingship. And every time we say we should take up our cross and follow him, we're basically informing our faith with that expanded understanding that just completely threw the disciples for a loop. They didn't know what to make of the crucifixion. So he finally asks, what kind of faith must it be? It must be faith in Christ alone rather than having head knowledge of him. It has to be a commitment from the heart. And he quotes Romans 9.10 here, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. This is a, a commitment from the heart to recognize, yeah, Jesus really is the Lord, creator. It's not somebody that I negotiate with. It's not even like an earthly king where they have some authority and I have some liberty. He's Lord, period. And the resurrection from the dead um, That'll come up later too. But it's important that we understand that God broke into history, that by that statement, Jesus was designated Messiah through an act of power, that basically the grave is overthrown. If that didn't happen, uh, Paul says we're still in our sins, but more importantly, we really don't know what's going on. And we're still gonna be living in the kingdom of the world. And we look at everything, all of our understandings of God, of ourselves, our lives, in terms of that brief arc between birth and the grave. That's not inclusive of the kingdom of God or what God has planned for us. So he wants to describe what salvation does this faith produce? What is salvation? He's very insistent it's a present salvation, that those who believe are immediately and literally saved the moment they accept God's saving grace by faith. In another sermon, he basically says that the salvation could be described as the whole work of grace from its first dawning in the heart to its consummation and glory. So he would agree with the scriptures that say we have been saved, we are being saved, and finally we will be saved. He says it is salvation from sin, observing that if there's been no change in our lives, then we are not saved. Our lives are characterized by erroneous thinking, sinful acts. So if the salvation hasn't worked and is not presently working some kind of change, it can't be salvation from sin unless we believe ourselves utterly perfect in love and utterly guiltless. And then third, he says on that note, salvation from the guilt of sin. Uh, here he quotes, Paul from the letter to the Romans, chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. In that sense, we don't have condemnation 
because we're not trying to earn our salvation. We're right with God. We're walking in God's spirit. And therefore, we don't even think of the old relationship. I do this, I get that. So there's no fear of damnation. Condemnation, he says, that sense of inner condemnation or fear reveals a lack of faith in God's grace. We're still looking for something that we can do, we can know, we can manifest that will give us evidence as though the cross of Christ weren't enough. We want to supplement it. We want to take it back and have it be something that we did, even if it's by an act of faith. We want to have faith in our faithfulness. So that if, oh, I wake up with a doubt this morning, oh, my salvation might be, it, it's done. That's part of the thing of faith. We walk in the spirit. We believe that we have received it, and we try every day to walk in it. That's religion of the heart. And that's where he says we have salvation from the power of sin. Here, looking at uh, some passages from 1 John, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and the wicked one toucheth him not. It's in 1 John. This means that sin should no longer dominate our lives. Whoever is born of God does not commit sin, for God's seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. I think the seed there is referring to the word of God really received. So we know that's the case. That's the truth. It restrains us. It guides us. It takes us where we're supposed to be going. And then he says, salvation includes justification. We're made right with God through the blood of Christ. This is the significance of the temple veil being torn when Jesus died on the cross. All the, that barrier that separated us from the presence of God, we were unfit to approach because we weren't they would say holy or clean. That's been taken care of by the sacrifice of Christ. So that those who have been justified grow towards perfection and the fullness of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect person, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's something that we'll get to in a minute, the idea that if you are right with God, you should be drawn to God. It's not like, oh, I've taken care of that, now I can go do my own thing. You were already free to do your own thing, but now you're free to approach God and do God's thing, God's perfect will for your life. And this is where we get to some of the objection. Doesn't this nullify personal holiness and good works? And he says, saving faith is by grace alone, but it does produce holiness and good works in the believer as a result. And then here's a separate take on it in terms of personal holiness. Does not this doctrine make void the law? The New Testament reveals that the law could not bring salvation. This is not an uncommon objection. All you have to do is have love in your heart, and who cares what the law says? Wesley says the law finds its fulfillment in Christ, and it is his finished work on the cross that meets all the law's demands. Saving faith puts us in Christ. He enables us to live obediently unto God. In Christ, the law is not made void. It is fulfilled. And in that sense, we also are able to fulfill the law. Uh, if we remain in Christ, if we take up our cross daily, walk by the Spirit, and follow him. That should pretty much be our goal. And it should say that if love is the fulfilling of the law, then any love that violates the law is not love. So perfection of love should also be perfection in the law. And if we're trying to argue our way out of that, then we really don't want a scriptural Christianity, but that's jumping forward. That's a little bit comes next. Does not this doctrine produce spiritual pride? He observes, it may in some, but they should not be set forth as the rule. Those who truly love God and understand his grace don't speak of themselves as being any better than the next person. Classic example of this is Jesus's parable or story uh, about the Pharisee praying in the temple. He's standing by himself praying to God this way. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Ah, oh, thanks that I'm, I'm just not a thief or a rogue or an adulterer or even like this tax collector. 
isn't his heart boiling over with love? He's so glad that he's such a great person, especially in comparison to his neighbor, who is or ought to be indistinguishable from himself. They're both people for whom Christ died. That's the fundamental point. So the contrast the Pharisee draws makes a distinction that he leans on for discerning his own spiritual status, not the cross. His reaction is self-congratulation rather than humble concern for the other. He doesn't think, wow, what can I do for this poor fellow? Can I comfort him? He looks pretty torn up over there. If you remember the rest of the parable, he wouldn't even look up at heaven. He was so, felt so bad. But that spirit in general is just very much opposed to that of the gospel. And on a related question to doesn't it overthrow the law or discourage holiness, does not this doctrine encourage sin? He flatly says, those who continue in sin and have no problem with it, I'll add, have not the faith that saves. Does not this doctrine drive people mad? He falls back again on that same idea of trying to establish righteousness by our own means. There will always be those who think that good works merits salvation. That's how they rest secure, not on the faithfulness of God, but on their own faithfulness. That's really what they're looking at day to day to give them assurance not God's love and God's faithfulness, but their own spiritual progress. They'll drive themselves to desperation, trying to feel right with God that way. So he concludes, we must ever speak of this saving faith, for it strikes at the very root of all false doctrine. Saving faith is our victory in and through Christ. Why does it strike at the root of all false doctrine? Somebody who comes and tries to tell you you're missing something, give you another doctrine, it's not going to have any appeal to you if you already have everything you need, unless there's some root of fear there that they can hook onto to try to get you to accept a new doctrine. Oh, you've got to believe this. You've got to do that. Um, that's basically how false doctrine takes root. Learning to discern true doctrine through the teaching of the spirit. Now that can be a, that can be kind of a stumbling journey. But the real false doctrines come when they're trying to teach us different ways of falling away from the cross of Christ back into having confidence essentially in ourselves or in the community of believers we happen to be hanging out with. Oh, these are the people. I stick with them. Again, that's not confidence in God. It's confidence in something else. And so Wesley's second sermon, The Almost Christian. He delivered this to uh, at St. Mary's Chapel in Oxford, where he was a reader. He had some official function there, and everyone got a turn to preach every couple of years. And I think they allowed him to come back after this one, but he certainly didn't pull too many punches. The governing scripture for the almost Christian is from the book of Acts, where Paul is testifying to a Roman official and Herod Agrippa. And because Herod Agrippa says, you almost persuade me to be a Christian, Paul. And somehow that made Wesley think, well, what does it mean to be almost a Christian? To hang back a little bit. And to even hang back a little bit is as though you weren't making a commitment at all. And he observes at the very outset of the sermon that the church is full of almost Christians who have not gone all the way with Christ. I can see all those very learned and men in the chapel as he's delivering this begin immediately to bristle. But anyway, let's go on. The almost Christian knows that God's word is true, but will not commit himself to following it. He knows it's true, but he won't commit himself to following it. He may hate all unrighteousness and sin in society. He's very, he's very great on uh, seeing that justice is done in the world. And he may, it just really bugs him. And maybe he even bugs him to the point of protesting and petitioning against it, but he cannot recognize sin in his own life. He doesn't want to look there at the log in his own eye. He wants to see the moat in societies. And Wesley says that in this way, he has a form of godliness. He cares about all the right things. His moral compass is pointed in the right direction in terms of the things he wants to achieve but he reveals that he does not have the power thereof. And here the reference is to 2 Timothy 3.2. 
which is instructive. Let's take a look at it. There's actually uh, two to four. For people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, arrogant, abusive, always using strong and abusive language to others, disobedient to their parents, not honoring their parents, acting like they're just awful. So in that way, ungrateful, unholy, basically inhuman, not very kind, implacable, can't, can't appease them. It's their way or the highway. Slanderers, to say all sorts of bad things about those that disagree with them, that they feel are working evil in the world. They themselves might be profligate, brutal in their language. Uh, they hate good, uh, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit. So they really think they're on the right track. But ultimately, they're lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God holding to the outward form of godliness, but denying its power, avoid them. What I find interesting about this is Paul saying that people can be like this, have all this stuff going on in them and look very godly. They believe the right things, say the right things, care about the right things, but you can see they don't really have any peace. Uh, they can't love others very well. They're so concerned about all the evil in the world that their entire heart is consumed with righteous indignation to the point of utter bitterness and likely a mixture of fear and fury. And Paul's saying, uh, try to stay away from them. <sighs> Such a person may pray stirring public prayers, but it is all part of the outward appearance of godliness, and such devotion is simply hypocrisy since he enjoys the praise of men. He refers to a passage here in John 12, where it, it happens that many, even of the authorities, believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, the ones who pretty much spoke for what was righteous in their society, they were the moral authorities of their day. Because of the Pharisees, they wouldn't confess what they believed, that they actually believed in Jesus, for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. They didn't want to lose their social cachet. They didn't want to be thought over the top, excessively religious. Religion was just part of their social fabric. It wasn't really a commitment to God. It was part of their social commitment. And in that sense, they loved human glory more than the glory that comes from God. And such a person does not think that he or she needs to be born again. Um, that person feels that they're, that they're good enough. A Christian as they are. And he observes that that's such a person is trying to live in the world as well as the kingdom of God, as though it were possible to do both, to have split allegiances. The classic formulation of that is be in the world, but not of it. That's not actually what we are. That's not our identity. It's not where we get our peace, our sense of belonging, our sense of meaning. As long as we try to have one foot in each world, it's like somebody who has one foot and two boats on a stormy sea. They're going to wind up falling in. And he observes that the almost Christian may love God, but not with all his heart, soul, and might. A distinction that occurred to me and that I feel in myself often is that I'm still actually at the center of my life. I'm thinking totally in terms of myself. Yeah, I love God. God's the most important thing in my life, more important than everything else. But then I realize, oops, I'm still putting myself at the center. I'm still making myself the boss. And it's very hard to see that, the difference between that state and the state where I'm actually willing to step aside and let the will and the word of God govern my life completely, trusting that he knows better than I do um, what to do with my life. So, he asks, what is an altogether Christian? Uh, to begin with, an altogether Christian is someone who loves God with his whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. All in. And for a penny and for a pound. And in that sense, the world has no control over such a person's life. That person is crucified to the world and the world to that person. His life and mouth proclaim. And here we, let's go look at 614. May I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. 
he's identifying with Christ to the point of actually having, you know, being crucified to the world, as though it just doesn't have any more claim on him. And the other passage that he goes on to quote is often translated this way, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I want you to look at another translation that's actually a better translation. It just doesn't get translated that way because it doesn't fit traditional Protestant doctrine. Where he says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So the life I now live in the body, I live because of the faithfulness of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is what Wesley means by saving faith the not almost Christian, but actual Christian faith. He's not trying to replicate the faith of Christ in himself. He's receiving the faithfulness of Christ through the Holy Spirit. And here's what the Greek actually looks like. In faith, I live. And there's a relative clause, like which does this or that does something. That faith of the Son of God, he's living by the faith of the Son of God who loves me and gives himself for me. He actually is participating in his mind in the faithfulness of Christ, not developing his own. That would go back to the distinction I made earlier. Am I trying to be my own boss and he's really important? I wanna imitate him, but I still wanna be my own boss or I actually wanna participate, be one in spirit with him. It's a subtle distinction. It can be hard to tell when we're doing one and the other. Um, one of the best measures is when we're succeeding, we find that we're doing, uh, we're walking in peace and joy and love and kindness. And the other one, we're constantly frustrated with our failures as though the world rose or fell based on whether or not we could pull off our daily tasks. And he observes next that the altogether Christian has true Christian love toward his neighbor. Um, I'm, focusing especially on the fact that this love is extended even to our enemies who persecute us. Love, as defined in 1 Corinthians, does not entertain evil thoughts towards others. It's just not something you sit around mulling about. What is wrong with this person? They must be completely consumed with greed and jealousy. And If we sit around thinking that way about others, we're not really walking in love. And it's willing to forgive any wrongs done to it. It's eager every moment that somebody who's offended us, no matter how badly, should repent because we want them to come to a knowledge of the truth. We don't want to see evil destroy their lives. We want them to regain their lives in Christ, to become whole and healthy and loving again the way God intended them. The idea of just wanting to hold on to wrongs shouldn't occur to love. And then he says, thirdly, an altogether Christian has true faith. Here, there's a reference to 1 John 5, 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. Think about that. If we say that we love God, we've been born of God, and we think of God as Father, that's what the Holy Spirit cries, then that's what God wants for everyone, whether we happen to be of the opinion that they currently are believers or not. God wants them to be children of their heavenly father as well. So we should love them. And if we don't, we're kidding ourselves. We're not really loving God the way we ought to. We're holding on to something that we shouldn't. He says, the sign of a true Christian is a life of holiness and righteousness. And Here's a verse to put in your hat. Uh, Pursue peace with everyone and the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Pursuing peace with everyone is a growth of the love in the heart towards them. You, you want nothing but peace with them. You want them to have the peace of God. Holiness is the status of somebody who's right with God and does God's will. Why wouldn't we want to do that? If we're negotiating, then God is maybe a friend in some way, but more of a business partner and not really God. But pursue holiness. You're not pursuing holiness. 
it might suddenly seem, uh, or not so suddenly after weeks or months, that the world doesn't look like it has a lot of God in it. Why should it? Because we've let all the God drain out of us. We've given up. Lastly, the altogether Christian knows that his sins are forgiven and is delivered from damnation through the blood of Jesus Christ. His confidence is in God alone. He lives a godly life by the power of God. Our confidence is in God alone. Don't smuggle yourself back into the picture. Ah, God set me back on my feet. I can do it now. Um, we have a great tendency to do that sort of thing. And finally, in conclusion, well, let's look at, uh, look at uh, James 2.19. He says that uh, anything else is simply dead and devilish other than a life of holiness and righteousness. Since Satan, though believing, does not have the nature of true Christian faith, that goes back to what we saw in the first sermon. Um, you believe that God is one, you do well, even the demons believe and shudder. So the conclusion, the question that must be asked, what kind of Christian am I? Am I almost or altogether Christian? The ultimate question being, am I willing uh, to be obedient to all that God requires of me as a believer? Am I willing to have the mind of Christ? Is that what I want? To have his faithfulness living in and through me? Or do I just want to get out from under punishment? Do I just want to get away with what I'm doing? Or am I ultimately so happy that the barrier is down that I want nothing more than to walk with God each and every step of my life? Then he observes, we think that it is enough to go by the name of Christ, doing a few good works here or there, and attending church occasionally, but we continue to fall far short of God's standard. And it's not a club. You can be a faithful member of a club, and if you, you, know, you wear your pin or your hat or your shirt, uh, you do what you're supposed to do, you attend the meetings, um, because that would be enough. God's standard is all in, all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, everything. And he says, we must get back to believing that Christ alone saves our souls from sin and gives us the power to live godly lives. John 15, 5, classic verse. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. It's a pretty stark image. If you're not abiding in Christ, you are a branch on the ground cut off the tree. It's not going to do anything but wither, fast or slow. Here I highlighted a sentence in red because I'm not sure. I didn't look it up in the original uh, sermon, but it seems a bit harsh. Those who die without being altogether Christians damn their own souls. That's putting a little bit more in their hands than I think needs to be. Uh, people are deceived, and I. it's my honest belief that many people are not exploiting God, but they don't have the faith to keep stepping out, and ultimately they're rendered unfruitful. Uh, to use the, that language, the devil can't take them back, but he can make them absolutely or relatively unproductive. They're not really any threat. They just kind of sit there. They don't do a lot. So, but he advises us, do not rest till you can say, my Lord and my God. Um, not as an intellectual exercise, like, hmm, I've concluded that I believe it as a fact, but as something where we have been confronted in our hearts by the truth. And you know what I mean? when You realize, oh, this, this is real. This is going to happen to me. Um, like when you see the siren go off on the road, and then you're wondering, hmm, I believe that's a police officer. He has authority to pull me over. And he swings around and he gets behind you, and then you feel it. It's a reality. It's going to happen. This, that's what he's talking about, that religion of the heart, that conviction we, when we feel that we know that something is true. We don't know that Jesus is Lord and God. We know him as Lord and God. We're confronted with the reality. And finally, he says, God knows those who truly love him. 
May we all experience what it is to be not an almost, but an altogether Christian, that we might know what it is to be justified, have God's peace, and sealed with the Holy Spirit. Now that God knows those who truly love him comes from 2 Timothy 2.19. But God's firm foundation stands bearing this inscription, the Lord knows those who are his. That's his business to know, not yours. You'll know in your heart that you're his, but you can't really set up an earthly standard to judge by. And let everyone who calls on the name of the Lord turn away from wickedness. So I'm happy with Christ's judgment, trust him, I trust his love, I don't need to know the details, but I do know that because he is pure, I want to be pure. That's another one from uh, 1 John. Uh, those who have this hope in them purify themselves as he is pure. Example there would be if you don't uh, dress up for a date, right? That's when the romance is gone, when you think you just sit around in your dirty clothes, don't even take a shower, don't brush your teeth when you get up in the morning. You stop trying. Now, the Lord knows who, who those who are his is also a reference to something, and this is going to be relevant later, so bear with me, to Korah's Rebellion in the Book of Numbers, everybody's favorite book with long lists of <laughs> numbers. Um, uh, Korah, well, let's just look at the text from number 16. Uh, Korah, son of Izhar, son of Kohath, son of Levi, along with Dathan and Abiram and on, uh, took 250 Israelite men. So these are a lot of people. This is a, it's a big group. It's not just them getting a wild hair. Leaders of the congregation, chosen from the assembly, well-known men, and they confronted Moses. They assembled against Moses and against Aaron and said to them, you have gone too far. All the congregation are holy, every one of them. And the Lord is among them. So why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? This is like a form of spiritual jealousy. They're not humble. They don't really want to be God's servants. God's like a badge or a merit badge or something, something that they can tout and feel self-important. Now notice that this, he's a son of Kohath. These particular sons of Levi were in charge of part of the holy things of God. They had a really important job. Uh, Aaron and the high priest would, and his sons would go in and they would cover up the ark, the candle stand, the table, the incense, the lamp stand. They would cover them up with blue cloth. And then after they had been covered, they'd come and say to Korah and the sons of Kohath, all right, you guys pick it up and you carry it. And apparently they felt slighted by that. Why, why can't we go in and cover it? Why should you be so special? We should be able to do everything you do. But notice Moses' reaction. When he heard it, he fell on his face. Then he said to Korah and all his company, I mean, he's falling on his face. He's throwing himself before God, uh, hoping for mercy, for something, to resolve this terrible situation they're putting themselves in. And, but he says to Korah and those with him, in the morning, the Lord will make known who is his and who is holy and who will be allowed to approach him. The Lord knows those who are his. They don't approach presume to approach in a high-handed manner as some sort of a something to inflate their ego and their pride. Uh, and what ultimately happens in this story is the earth opens up and swallows them. Wow, that sounds pretty severe. Why would that happen? Does, shouldn't the punishment fit the crime? It turns out that this is a little obscure, but I think you might find it interesting. The word for covering the holy things to put that blue covering over them before they were, you know, they're covered up before they're carried with the children of Israel as they'd move from place to place. That word for cover basically means swallow. They swallowed them with blue cloth. And in the same way, they said they were deserving. They were just as holy as the holy things. And so the earth opened up and swallowed them. This is a sort of spiritual pride and spiritual ambition that is Again, almost like that Pharisee praying, thank you that I'm not like this loser over here. It's, it's a spiritual arrogance, and it, it doesn't have anything to do with the spirit of Christ. As he said, I am meek and lowly in heart. That's the reason we'll find rest for our souls.
Okay, and he says, may we all experience what it is to be not an almost, but an altogether Christian, that we might know what it is to be justified, have peace, and sealed with the Holy Spirit. The third sermon is Awake Thou That Sleepest. This was by Charles Wesley. He also delivered it in St. Mary's Chapel at Oxford, and I imagine it had created even a bigger stir than Wesley's did. He's very, very fiery. The governing text here is Ephesians 5.14. Awake you who sleeps, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. And he makes this uh, proposition. Only those Christians who are conscious, attentive, and obedient can be used by the Lord to further his work. They can't be asleep. They have to be alert. They have to be paying attention. They have to be actively pursuing God's will. Those who are spiritually asleep remain in the natural state and are controlled by the flesh. Let's not over-spiritualize the notion of flesh and spirit. Flesh means that you're going based on your natural psychology, your instincts, the stuff that's bubbling up from your amygdala, your fears, your desires, your hopes, your dreams, uninformed by the things of God. You're just being a normal human. Not Evil, if you were uh, an animal, a squirrel or a deer or a dog, that's the way they're supposed to live. They live by their instincts. We're not supposed to live by our instincts. We're supposed to live according to the word and the will of God. So that's what it means to be controlled by the flesh, to be a person who doesn't care about being awake, alive, alert, attentive, and obedient to the will of God. Such a person will never ask, what must I do to be saved? And that comes from Acts 16.30. It's the jailer uh, in the, the jail of Philippi, where the jail is sh shaken open and the prisoners remain. The guy's about to off himself because he thinks he's going to be executed for losing the prisoners, but they're all still there. And he says, what must I do to be saved? Here he comes right out, Charles does, and says there are sleepers to be found in the church too. And these people who profess Christ, uh, you can tell them, he thinks, because they usually feel uncomfortable amongst those who truly love the Lord. If somebody's excited about their faith and they say something crazy, like they feel that the Lord revealed himself to them in a set of circumstances or told them to do something, and by the, the outcome, they're just absolutely sure that it was a divine appointment, they don't know what to do with that. They're like, be rational. Go by your logic, go by your feelings. What is the spirit stuff? So they will as much as possible avoid true Christian fellowship. It's fine if you want to sit around and have coffee, have tea, talk about your business, what's happening in the schools. But if you want to talk about your faith life, yeah, they'll probably not show up for that. The sleeper tries to comfort his heart with the notion that he is not as bad as others. So to the comparison trap, again, like the Pharisee looking at the sinner, and at least he goes to church once in a while. He doesn't actually ignore God. He shows up. Um, these are the relatives that show up out of town when they're, uh, uh, somebody's on their deathbed, but they weren't there when they were sick. They weren't there to take care of them. They didn't call to see how they were doing. The Lord Jesus Christ calls them whitewashed sepulchers. Sepulchers where you bury people, uh, like a mummy in one of those stone sarcophagi. They appear outwardly spiritual, but are really full of uncleanness. And this is where I thought of a quote that C.S. Lewis took from George MacDonald from one of his fairy tales, this idea of the whitewashed sepulchers. It's easy to overlook the fact that in the New Testament, the hypocrites did not think they were hypocrites. They were really believed they were on the right path. Something in them was probably itching and telling them that that wasn't the case, but consciously in their minds, they were fully convinced. And it, here's the quote, though, from that fairy tale, and it puts chills down my spine. He jumped up, as he thought, and began to dress, but to his dismay, found that he was still lying in bed. Now then I will, he said. Here goes. I am up now. But yet again he found himself snug in bed. Twenty times he tried, and twenty times he failed. For in fact he was not awake, 
only dreaming that he was. Is that what a life of frustration? I mean, if, you're, if we're frustrated in our lives, are we actually, at least in part, asleep, unable to wake ourselves up? And whatever we do in our heads and our lives to try to fix it is just a dreamer dreaming of being awake? Arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. That's something that only the power of God can do, to really receive the Spirit and to re receive it every day and walk by it. Uh, here's another one from Ephesians 2.1. You were dead through trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now work, at work among those who are disobedient. Waking up means coming out of the life of the world. Um, and then he says again, it is time to wake up or perish. And a, another passage in Romans where we get this sleep, sleeping and waking metaphor. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. The old times of confusion, the ways of the world, they're not passing away quickly as we think of quickly, but the world is passing away. We should be living in the kingdom that is coming the kingdom of God and not the kingdom of the world. And so he says, realize that you sleep in the arms of Satan if you do not walk with Christ. We often think that there's many ways to God. We hear that thrown about as validity in every religion. And it is true that those who earnestly believe that God exists and seek God and believe that God rewards those who seek them, based on Hebrews, they're not going to come away empty-handed. But Jesus said, no, there's just two ways. There's a narrow way, and then there's a broad way that leads to destruction. But this notion uh, that we should awaken from the false dreams of happiness and contentment that the world holds out to us, and that we might actually have planted in our souls, so that we think what the world defines as being good, blessed, and happy, that's what we, we crave, and we reject the blessings, the spiritual blessings of God. And he says, don't you know that an eternity of happiness and blessing await you? And I like what C.S. Lewis says in a comparison here. He says, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. And maybe that is true. We set our, our sights and our hopes in life far too low. Okay, um, just a moment. Um, I'm going to have to stop the recording. Somebody will not give up. Okay. Charles says that clean living and reputation will not save us from God's wrath. Salvation is by faith only, uh, so return to faith in him. You must live godly in Christ Jesus. There he looks at 2 Timothy 3.12. Indeed, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If you really want to do this, it's going to rub up against other people at some point. But he says, wicked people and imposters, I guess those would be the almost Christians, will go from bad to worse, deceiving others and being deceived. And he asks, are you willing to hear his voice while you still have time? And there he says, he looks at Hebrews 3, 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as on the day of testing in the wilderness where your ancestors put me to the test, though they had seen my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation, and I said, they always go astray in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. As in my anger I swore, they will not enter my rest. Take care, brothers and sisters, that none of you may have an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. This is a reference to Korah's rebellion. 
the rebellion in the wilderness. Uh, the ones who somehow fell back into this earthly pattern of making it a, an earthly struggle rather than just a divine and present reality of the kingdom that we receive by faith, that all of us participate in as equal members by walking according to the spirit. It is not something that is sorted out here. Uh, it's not about what Korah thought it was. It wasn't in the outward uh, status symbols and functions of society. It was always a matter of the heart. And as the scriptures say, Moses was the humblest of people. Korah clearly wasn't. He wanted something for himself. He had a hunger that being God's people, being one of God's people, just didn't satisfy. It wasn't enough. He needed to lord it over others, even in the faith, even in the presence of God Almighty, somehow. That's an unbelieving heart that forgets who God is, what God has done, uh, that can actually get into little petty squabbles and power struggles like that with their brothers and sisters. So let's do be careful of that, all of us. And then he says, here's a promise to those who wake up. If you arise out of worldliness, you will receive God's light in your soul. For it isn't possible to receive Christ and not experience such blessings. His glory is available to all who will believe. You can't miss out on it. If you trust in Christ, sometimes we forget that that's what faith means. It means trust. The classic preacher's illustration is that a, a group of people that are uh, standing on top of a building and a guy has a wire strung from one building to another and he gets a wheelbarrow full of bricks and he says, do you believe I can push it across? Well, they don't know. So he pushes the wheelbarrow across full of bricks, then he pushes it back and they say, yep, we believe you can do it. And he says, now I want one of you to get in the wheelbarrow. That's the difference between faith and faith, right? The faith that's just, I sort of believe it, and the faith that is also a commitment. Will we commit ourselves to Christ? Will we commit ourselves to his, his example, his will? Will we take up our cross daily and seek by the Spirit and by his grace to walk as he walked? So he concludes, we all have to make a choice. It is between God and this world, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of this world. Onlookers criticize if you decide to commit your life to Christ. They may say you have become too religious. The fact remains, we must go all the way with Christ. And that's hardly surprising. With all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. It's a, it's a total commitment. And it's done in faith. And that sums up or completes the analysis of the first three sermons. If you've made it to the end, I do thank you, and I encourage you to look into future series. God bless you.